<laughs> okay, so well, here's the thing. So why in the world, if God's the one who gave us all this stuff, why in the world would we trust our judgment better than God's? Why are you thinking about that? Consider this. God's book for God's provision for us and for all of creation, right? We wouldn't have anything. But that we have it is hardly a license to consume or to expend with no thought as to why God made the provision for us in the first place. Thus, we come to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. It, it is a, a crazy, straightforward story. But I want you to be sure you don't slip up on what may or may not be the obvious in it. Um, I want you to look for the word sin, bad, or wrong in the story, okay? You ready? All right, here we go. Jesus told this parable to certain people who had convinced themselves that they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. So Jesus says, two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed about himself with these words. God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else. Crooks, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I mean, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. I mean, he wouldn't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. Rather, he struck his chest and he said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So, okay. What are we supposed to do with this story? I mean, first of all, who, who's the, where did you see the word wrong in the story? Anywhere? Bad? Okay, but who's the bad guy in the story? Are you sure? I mean, but hear me say, for centuries, that's been the common interpretation. It has. And there's good reason for making that move theologically. But let's be clear. The Pharisees weren't really bad guys. They get a bad rap in the Gospels, sure, and it is well-deserved. But they were trying to save a nation. They were trying to protect it from the oppression of the Roman occupation. And look, listen to what the Pharisees said. I mean, everything he said was true. He probably did fast. He probably did give a tenth. And there he is in the temple, dutifully, trying to do what is prescribed for him to do. He was righteous. He was doing everything right. So what's up then? Why is it that Jesus says about the publican or the tax collector that he was justified? Well, let's be clear. We say the Pharisees are bad, but we see that, hey, he was trying to do everything right. Look, Jesus points out the virtue of the tax collector, but let's be clear. This was a bad guy. I mean, this is a guy who was thought to be complicit with the Roman occupation. Because he's not only collecting money from his fellow citizens, he's skimming some off the top, and he's doing so under the auspices of the Roman occupation. People think that he is a traitor to his own people. Back in the day, there would have been a question about whether or not he was lower than the person who hurt that little girl on Bevan Oaks Road. He's bad. But he's justified. What is that supposed to mean? And what are we supposed to do with that? I mean, it almost sounds like you could do everything right and still be wrong with God. Doesn't it? But pay attention to what they say. Pay attention to what Jesus is trying to, to help us see. I mean, as we mentioned, everything in your life, everything, is given. Isn't it? 
everything is given. And, and what do you do with a gift? You say thank you. Say thank you. <laughs> you might open. I mean, let's look. If, if I, if you give me a gift, right? Try to give me a gift. I mean, is it a gift until I take it? Well, if you think that's tricky, watch this. Here, give, give it to me. Wow, that's a great thank you for this gift. That's great. Did I receive it? Even though I left it on the table? Did I really? How is this a gift that I received until I at least opened it? How many of you have ever gotten a fruitcake? <laughs> <laughs> and then didn't eat. <laughs> now look, they, did, now they tell me there's this place, um, I think south of us, that makes the best fruit cakes in the world. And I'm told that if I had a, some of that, then I wouldn't talk bad about fruit cakes. They're really good. Um, that's what I hear. Really I haven't ever tasted it. But come on. <laughs> Right? And, and the, but the thing is, if we don't open the gift, right, did we really receive it? And how can we ever think that what we have is a function of all that we deserve? Y'all, what we have are blessings, aren't they? And we have them because we're supposed to actually be blessings. Now, let me tell you why I think so. Um, this is going to be really old wisdom. It comes from the Old Testament. And it's actually from the book of the prophet Joel. It's chapter 2, beginning with verse 28. After that, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon everyone. Now, when he says everyone, you think he means just the chosen people? You think he means just church people? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but everyone means at least everyone who really believes in God and not everybody else who doesn't, right? Everyone. Oh, well, so everyone is... Everyone. That gets tricky fast. But listen further. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, get this, I will also pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves. <laughs> God has went off the deep end. Now why do I say so? I mean, think about where God's spirit used to live when it was among the people. Okay, The tabernacle Right was this set of tents that, um, that Moses set up in order to park the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant contained what? Anybody remember Sunday school? The Ten Commandments, the actual tablets. Okay? It was this big gold chest. I mean, you, you everybody see Indiana Jones? Okay. And, it, I mean, that, that was real. I mean, that's what they did. They had it in the Ark of the Covenant, and they stuck it in this place called the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the priest, the designated priest, mind you, got to go into the Holy of Holies and pray on behalf of the people. And if anybody who tried to go in there and they weren't supposed to, they got zapped. I mean, this was really serious stuff. And God's Spirit resided in the Holy of Holies. And look, just because they went and built the temple, they kept the same design in mind. You see any similarities? Same big rectangle, same smaller rectangle, and the Holy of Holies was there inside of that. And the Holy of Holies had this curtain, okay, that was drawn to protect you from the Ark of the Covenant. But God's Spirit lived in there, okay? This is how it was all set up. Now here we are in Joel, and what did God say? Everyone. So guess what? You are the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Did you wake up this morning and say to yourself, Oh man, I am the Holy of Holies. <laughs> no? Well, you tell me. What do you read? What did it say? If we bear the Spirit of God, 
You bear the Spirit of God. What does that make you? Say it because it's true. You are the Holy of Holies. It's messed up, isn't it? <laughs> but look, there's hope there. There is. Because it goes beyond the fact that we possess, if you can even say such a thing, God's Spirit. God's Spirit lives in us. I mean, listen to this argument that Paul makes after talking a bit about sexual immorality. He says, look, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God and you don't belong to yourselves? You've been bought and paid for to so honor God with your body. <laughs> so who possesses who here? And look, let's be clear. The idea that I'm owned is patently offensive to me. And it ain't just because I'm black. It's, a offense, it's offensive to me because I like to think that I control my own destiny. That I own my own stuff. This is my life. But I'm bought and paid for. And God possessing us isn't like... You know, God's trying to amass wealth. God is trying to build a family. God's gathering people. And these people that God is gathering, God is placing God's spirit and making us all the holy of holies. So here's the $64 million question. Because it's not, it's not about whether or not we possess the Holy Spirit or even our stuff. Stewardship is not a function of how well we gather and spend. It's measured by why we spend, because we don't own it. If it's a gift from God, then it's a question of what are we doing with God's stuff? Walter um, Bazard says that in response to our worry about scarcity, the Lord our God promises abundance. And in an era like ours, in a culture hallmarked by a fear of scarcity, it is difficult to live lives that are unstinting and free of anxiety about the future. Nevertheless, believers can and do live freely, hopefully, and generously because we know a secret. The God of abundance has promised to care for us at the hungry feast until our longings and those of the world are fully and forever satisfied. You are the Holy of Holies. And the Spirit of God doesn't rest behind a curtain anymore. What are you doing with the gift that God has given you. What are you doing with it? Is it just sitting on the shelf? Like a fruitcake? Or are you trying it out? Real giving then, y'all, isn't a function of possession. It's a response. It's, it's an acknowledgement. Like the tax collector, it is recognized that God is God and we are not. And that humility is the virtue of the day. If I'm giving something to you and I don't have an attitude that God gave it to me first, then I'm not giving right I don't care how much I give. If I died and left everything to the church, but I did it so that everybody could go, woo, that David Ely is something else. That's not right. But if I give, even if all I have is a dollar, 
and I say, I'm giving this because of what God has done for me and for what God has provided for me. That's right. If I say, I'm going to spend my time um, playing music, volunteering in this place or that or whatever it is, I'm going to help with this piece, or I'm going to make sure that I use my gifts for that. I'm going to exercise my voice. I'm going to make sure they can exercise their voice. And I'm going to do it because of what God has done. Then yes, that's right. That is real giving. So, you know, there have been these wristbands, right? And um, one of them that was going around said, live strong. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And it was put forward by somebody who turned out not to be living terribly strong. But if you were to make a wristband out of the passage, scripture passages or even the sermon, my encouragement to you would be to live humble. Because when God gives, there are not strings. I mean, we can never pay God back, right? I mean, really. All we can do is respond. And so what happens then when we give? We find ourselves yet again with nothing to claim but our dependence on God's mercy, says David Luce. And so how do we do it in such a way that acknowledges our humility before God? Consider these four questions. First, are you being the blessing that you think you are? I mean, just because I did something nice for you, right, doesn't necessarily mean I'm trying to be a blessing. Because if I guilt you about it all the time, then I didn't really give it to you. Right? It's not a blessing. You got it. You're not really being a blessing. Yeah, exactly. Are you really being a blessing? And second, what are you doing with God's Spirit that has been placed in you? I mean, really. When you go home, take some time to look in the mirror and say the words, I am the Holy of Holies. Mm. No, no, no. Go there, because the Scripture goes there, and ask yourself, what are you doing with the Spirit of God that's been placed in you? And third, how often do you give God credit for what you have in your life beyond a verbal or even a mental acknowledgement? I mean, would anybody else recognize that your attitude is that what you have in your life is a gift? Would anyone else recognize that God provided these things for you by what you say and by what you do? And fourth, as I said, we're going to have a stewardship question related to our theme um, these next several weeks. And the question tonight is, does your giving acknowledge God's provision in your life? Does your giving acknowledge God's provision in your life? 